Imagine a berserk combination of Andrei Tarkovsky's Stalker, his Andrei Rublev, and Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Now, imagine that this movie is black and white throughout, that it's nearly three hours long, that it seems to have aspects in common with theatre of cruelty, with theatre of the absurd, that most of the dialogue is composed of non sequiturs which don't particularly develop character, they don't seem to drive the plot, they don't necessarily even really develop philosophical ideas very much. Sounds... sounds great to some people, sounds shit perhaps to others. I fucking loved this film, I thought it was fantastic. There's obviously a lot more to say. So, the film is hard to be a god. The director is uh, Russian director Alexei German. This is the last of his six or seven features that he made uh, before he died in 2013. Now, it's based on a novel, uh, I believe with the same title, by Boris and Arkady Strugatsky, who wrote the novel Roadside Picnic on which Tarkovsky's Stalker was based. I believe that uh, German wanted to adapt this from very early on, I think from late in the 60s, and acquired the, the, the rights later, um, after, after a, a less successful attempt to film it, which I've, I've not seen so I can't, I can't comment on. Filming started in 2000, it concluded in 2006, there was then a lengthy period of post-production which was interrupted by Alexei Gerban's death in 2013. His widow and son then completed the work. So, what, what do you get? What you get, as I've said, is a near three hour black and white uh, supposedly science fiction film. The science fiction element is that a group of scientists have come from future Earth to a Earth-like planet and the section of the Earth-like planet that we see looks very much like medieval Europe. We're told in a voiceover at the beginning that they're here to sort of act as nursemaids but not to interfere too much. They're basically there to look after the thinkers, the intellectuals, the people who might help drive a renaissance, who could help push this planet into its next stage of development. This stage of development has never happened. The, the renaissance hasn't occurred. What we're left with is uh, a squalid medieval um, city where most of the action takes place, all of the action takes place, um, which is falling under the sway of uh, first grey monks and then later more, more brutal, more strict uh, black monks. It's becoming kind of medieval equivalent of a police state. Intellectuals are routinely gathered up and executed. Um, visually, the film is both very stark and very cluttered. It's a, a high contrast black and white. The frame is packed and there are always things close to the camera. The, the protagonists, the speakers, the, the characters are very often very close to the camera. Frequently there'll be something even closer, there'll be a, a hand or something dangling from the top of the screen or there'll be something protruding from the side, even nearer the camera. Sometimes to the extent that your, your main protagonist is appearing from behind some sausages or, or something dangling from the ceiling, unidentifiable. And then there's just the everyday waste. There's, there's people wandering about, there's animals, there's... Uh, chairs, torture devices, bits of medieval machinery. The, the frames are packed, they feel very crowded and claustrophobic. 
and it's 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 dark it's it's autumn so you're often inside if you're outside then it's raining or it, it's snowing on a couple of occasions or if it's not doing that then it's misty or it's it's certainly always wet and muddy and if there's no mud for instance if we're inside and where there's less mud then they'll there may well be viscera certainly there are people who are diseased and deformed all over the place people also it's hard to say whether it's strictly fourth wall breaking there are constantly characters constantly background people constantly people wandering across in front of the camera staring straight into the lens and uh, apparently addressing the camera, the audience, whoever is there, maybe nobody at all. Sometimes that person may well be Don Ramata, who is the main protagonist. He is one of the scientists. Don Ramata is not his real name. We do hear his real name, I think, once. I can't, I can't remember what it is. Um, in this world, he, he's known to the, the inhabitants as, as Don Ramata. He and his, his fellow scientists, they get out of the city, or I presume they're one of different cities, they, they meet up once in, in a wilderness where they drive a tank around for a short time and they complain and, and, and bitch about the level of development uh, that this world has, has, has reached and don't talk too much about going back to Earth, although I think it, it does come up and it comes up again toward the end. So it's a, a very immersive medieval looking experience and the similarity which I mentioned to Monty Python and the, and the Holy Grail should be evident. Everyone, everyone is covered in shit. Even, even the nobles are covered in shit. They're slightly less pervasively covered and for most of the time Don Ramata has white shirts and uh, white handkerchiefs, but uh, he, 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 he he's dirty. Everyone um, coughs and, and spits out all the time. So if you have difficulty with these kind of things, it may be one to avoid. I don't think that's a good, good enough reason to avoid it. I think this is something that, that, that is, uh, it's a real experience, it's very enjoyable, although it sounds kind of, in, in some ways it sounds a little grim and a little off-putting and as though there's, there's not much story and there isn't. Um, it's essentially Don Ramata's day-to-day -day life in this benighted place. Um, he, he's been largely untouched because he's presumed to be the son of a god and something of a god himself and we do see that he is physically powerful, he has a lot of authority and he's a, he's a good uh, a good sword fighter so I mean in a sense if you wanted stakes you might perhaps find it a little disappointing it, it's, it's perhaps not like The Devils which was another comparison I was thinking of making um, because in the devil's uh, coffee, um, in the devil's, all your protagonists are at physical risk. They're at, at, at risk of of death at any time. Even the Oliver Reed character, who we who, who we follow through, here there's perhaps less of a sense of, of risk to Don Ramata. I don't think that's necessarily a problem. It, it's not necessarily something that you're, you're aware of throughout anyway, but even if you are, it sort of helps to, to play up his outsideness and, and given that, that, that you're kind of implicated in things by people constantly looking at, at you through the screen 
he doesn't need to be as much of, a, of an audience avatar as, as, he, as he might otherwise be. You're kind of already there. You're amidst this squalor, this this dirt, people spitting, uh, casual brutality. You're aware that this is an unpleasant and dangerous and smelly uh, world in which lives are are short, and it's it's very clear that um, the lives of children and women are, are even less valuable than those of, of men, uh, which is, is not, not to do with the filmmaker, this is in, in entirely to do with the, the, the nature of this world, this is how these people are. Let me go back to the, uh, the frames being crowded with stuff coming in from, from all over the place. At first I wasn't quite sure what that was about, why that was why that was necessary. Was it just an attempt to establish a veracity? Was it uh, an attempt to to do something else that I couldn't think of? What I think it's there for and what for me it achieves is it, it gives you a sense of how confined, how physically and how mentally confined these people's lives are. There's not much room for anything beyond day-to-day -day survival, beyond the immediate pains, beyond the, the immediate confusion, beyond whatever forces of, of, of nature and mankind you're, you're subject to. People don't have a great deal of agency. And it, it also, to me, says something about Don Ramata's mental state. He's confined, he's trapped in this place. Uh, people are, are, are constantly in his face. He, he's estranged from Earth, what he has has now and his sort of central conflict is that he he's supposed to be largely non-interventionist but he's been here so long, he's seen so much of this uh, squalor and pain that he he struggles with this aloofness, hence, hence the the title that the, the hard to be a god it's it's this idea of if you have this power, is it best to intervene? Is it best to to stand back and 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 let these people handle their own development? Uh, clearly, Earth has made the decision that it's best to leave leave the the, the, the place to its to its own development. And, and I think probably a lot of us would say that is how it should be, but on the ground Don Ramata finds this more difficult and this clustering of the frame I think indicates, it helps, it helps to demonstrate that. There, there are a couple of other things which really impressed me which which I didn't see mentioned in in any reviews, uh, at any length, which I, I think are worth talking about. One is there are quite a lot of long takes, there are some quite complicated long takes where you'll start in one location, the camera might move, there'll be a lot of action happening, the camera will then move to to follow someone or to, to look somewhere else, and it may may follow them through uh, quite a, a complicated uh, set, of, set of movements or, or sort of down levels or through rooms and then then stop again while something is said and while there's other movement happening around them. Uh, th these are quite impressively staged. They're... they're Different from um, uh, 
I'm going to need to edit. These long takes are very different from those in the films of uh, Miklos Jancsó, the uh, Hungarian director, because he makes great use of wide open spaces. You'll have a camera moving in one direction, large groups of people moving in another, and perhaps another group of people moving in a different direction uh, behind those, and you'll have two or three groups of people circling with the camera also circling and they're, they're, they're very impressive, they're sort of spatially very interesting. Alexei German in Hard to Be a God doesn't have, hasn't given himself deliberately that sort of space to play with. These are much more confined interiors so the camera is pushing through pushing through people, pushing through sausages, dead dogs and wolves hanging from the ceiling, through chairs and, and, and clutter. And sometimes it's struggling to catch sight of the protagonist or whoever it's, it's following in that moment, especially when there are people constantly popping up in, in the frame and staring at you and addressing you. But nonetheless, these, these are very Im impressive long takes and, and there are some impressive editing in them. It, it's, it's not, you're not always aware that you're watching a long take and sometimes what feels like a long take you suddenly realise may have been broken once or twice by, by edits when someone went past the camera or, or perhaps it was broken by a clear edit but you dis simply disregarded that because what was happening was very much continuous. The other thing which I was very impressed by, and I see from checking the, the Sight and Sound review that this was uh, very much a, a post-production thing, was the, uh, the sound uh, production. The, the voices, I'm told, were recorded afterwards, they do, they were recorded, they're not recorded in the environment. So it, they have a kind of... They, they have a, a, a kind of intimacy and, and presence, but it, it also has a slight studio sound which can take you out of the space, but I, I understand that's largely deliberate. But what was most impressive to me was the the ambient sound. There, there's no, there's no music apart from a couple of, of, of things which I'll, I'll come on to. But there's no uh, music in the sense of orchestral swells or anything telling you what to think or, or, or underpinning. There's no external music. What there is is, is there's a lot of sound. There's people hawking and spitting. There's people talking, mumbling. There's creaks, there's the sound of rain, there's the sound of animals snuffling about, there's the sound of footsteps. And there are other sort of ambient sounds that you might expect. What's brilliant is that you're, you're concentrating on, on the dialogue mostly because it's human speech, because that's what you do. Uh, you're aware of other sounds. There will quite often be ambient sounds that are happening that you don't notice until they're cut, and then suddenly, this, for a moment, the soundtrack will go silent, and then someone will start speaking, usually Don Ramata, and then sounds will begin to, to pick up again. And it, it has a nice rhythmical effect, some, some, uh, suddenly everything stops, and then begins again. So the the sound I I really liked. As I said, there, there was some music. You sort of start early on there's someone uh, I can't remember if they're kind of humming or singing. It might have been this sort of clerical singing. You get the monks essentially droning. They're they're not very musical, they're the, they're the most music really that you, you get, other than people 
whistling, although I think the main person who whistles again is, is your, your central protagonist, Don Ramata. The most recognisable, the most obvious music, though, is Don Ramata has a uh, flute or a cornet or, or, or any, an instrument of of that nature, a wind instrument, which he plays and on which he plays what is recognisably jazz. Um, you know, this is, it's, it's interesting that essentially the contemporary elements, the, the, the tank that I mentioned earlier, that the, the, the scientists drive around in, in in one scene, and Don Ramata's jazz, which comes up in two scenes, are the, 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 you know, these are contemporary elements, but they become the, the science fiction elements in this immersive medieval world. Uh, so at the beginning he's playing jazz on this, and his, his slaves uh, all have rags in their ears because they can't stand to hear it. The jazz re-emerges at the end when Don Ramata is going somewhere, whether he's going back to Earth or to another city or... or into exile somewhere, it's never made clear. He's sitting on the back of a cart and he's playing this jazz and a couple of his retainers are, are joining in. One's, one's playing some bass wind instrument, one of them is tapping his own helmet. Uh, percussively, they're not adding a huge amount to the music, most of it is, is this flute. Uh, he he, he goes out of sight quite early on, his entourage pass out of sight and pass back again and, and again out of sight. And a man and his young child, I think daughter, come toward the camera and, and they discuss, excuse me, they discuss the music. Uh, the man uh, asks, do you like this music? And the girl says something like, I don't know, I don't think so, it makes my tummy hurt. And, and the man agrees with her, and that, I think that may be the last dialogue in the film, I think they sort of pass out, and then there's one of very few fades, most of the edits are, are, are sharp, there are a couple of times where you fade out, usually uh, quite quite often when, when Don Ramata uh, passes out. I haven't talked much about story because really there isn't one. There, there's the story that I described at the beginning, the basic outline. There's sort of an arc. Uh, Don Ramata is trying to get hold of a, uh, of a Dr. Budak who's one of the intellectuals that he, he needs to protect. Um, he's shown a few fake uh, Budaks uh, before eventually getting to him. He also has a lover who gets killed toward the end when the, the black uh, monks uh, come into the city, invade the city, come into his, come into his house. Um, the Black Monks, troublingly, it's never really explained who they are, and throughout the, uh, the translation, at least, on, on the, um, the subtitles, they're referred to throughout as, as the Blacks, which is perhaps a little, a, a little troubling if, you, if you're not quite up to speed. But uh, I, I, I don't think it's... I don't think it's too much of a, of a problem. It, 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 everybody in this film is, is, is white, albeit white covered in shit, or perhaps in, in, in viscera and blood. Um, it should be said there's a fair amount of nudity, there's a fair amount of violence. I didn't find the violence particularly explicit or shocking. People might find the nudity more shocking, particularly because there's more, more male nudity than female nudity, certainly more explicit male nudity. Um, 
I've completely lost my train of thought. <laughs> Let's take a break. So, regaining my train of thought, uh, I was talking about the plot. Really, we're following Don Ramata as he falls apart, as he loses his sense of remaining aloof, remaining distant from from this world and from, from these people's troubles. He's starting to become more involved and at the end the intervention of the black monks causes him to completely break out. Previously he's never He's never killed anyone, for instance. He, although it's entirely off screen, he and some of the other Earth scientists and, and his retainers basically seem to go on a, on a bloody kill rampage and murder everyone, certainly all the, all the black monks, and utterly devastate this city. And we're left. Well, we're left with, with, with Don Ramata and, and his retainers leaving in their, in their carriages, but before that we have a long passage with Don Ramata sitting with his feet, his feet in a pond, uh, sort of having fairly directionless discussions. This isn't really a spoiler, it, it, it doesn't matter. Personally with spoilers I don't think it matters with any film. With this film particularly, it doesn't matter. I mean, the reason I, th I think spoilers don't matter generally is that a film is about, or, or a novel, or, or, or any narrative fiction, is about more than... It's about more than story. It's, it's about character. It's about ideas. It's about the way in which it's presented. It's about style. It's about all these elements. With film particularly, you have you have the visual elements, you have you have the composition of your frame, uh, you have whether you, you're using long shots or short shots, whether you're using black and white or colour or both, what the sound is like, what people say, how they say it, the acting, the performances, the costumes, the, the setting. All of these things are are important. They're as important as the story, and in this, perhaps more so. It's it's more important that you're immersed in this world. It's more important that you're as confused and as as troubled by the, the, this squalor, by this this constant bombardment of images and and people. That it's important that you feel in some way complicit in this world. These things are more important than, than the basic story. It, that, that's a vehicle to hang, to hang ideas off. Um, so yeah, yeah I, I don't think, I, I don't generally have a, a problem with spoilers and in, in this I don't, I don't think spoilers are, are that relevant. The film doesn't really conclude, it doesn't give you answers, it doesn't tell you what it's about, it doesn't tell you what message to take away from this, it doesn't tell you whether you should like or dislike this protagonist now, it doesn't tell you whether you should like or dislike the monks, it doesn't tell you any of those things, it presents what happens to you. And given Don Ramata's central conflict, his, the, the sense of him having to try and be impartial but gradually having that broken down, I think it's already implicit that the camera is not objective, the storytelling is not objective, it's implicit that this is subjective, that your take on it is subjective, that whether you think what he's done is good or bad, whether you identify with him, whether you identify with other characters, whether you think you would do the same in that situation, 
that's left up to you and that is Im implicit in the way the film is made. I should, should say, the film is, is beautiful, it looks, it looks fantastic, it, it really does look great, it sounds, sounds good. Uh, it's compelling, it's immersive, it didn't feel like three hours, it's not quite three hours, it's 170 minutes, it's two hours fifty. It doesn't really feel like a drag. I, yeah, I, I wasn't aware of, of time going by in that sense because there's a lot happening. And despite this emphasis on, on, on squalor and misery and, and shit, it's it is enjoyable, it is fun, there are funny moments. It's not just misery, 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 dismalness. Uh, it doesn't quite have the, the, the sort of bizarre, um, florid um, weirdness of, 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 of bits of, of Andre Rublev. I mean, Andre Rublev starts with someone launching this ramshackle hot air balloon, uh, which they crash. You have the, this uh, pagan party in the woods that uh, Andre Rublev comes comes across in that film. People running around dancing naked. Uh, you you don't have those sort of florid flourishes. These things popping up in, in, in that sense. It, it's sort of much more on a, on, on a similar level throughout, but it is, it is entertaining. It is a fun watch. I would really, I would really recommend it. If you think it sounds interesting, if you think this bizarre black and white science fiction medieval uh, crowded, dangly film if you, if you think it sounds interesting, then I would really recommend trying to go and see it. I'd, I'd recommend seeing it in the cinema because it becomes much more much more immersive when you have this huge, huge screen. And especially if you can't quite see the corners, although I'd make sure that you can, you know, you can see the subtitles because it is useful, even though they don't lead anywhere. Uh, there were a couple of other things I, I, I did want to say before I summed up, but I obviously forgot about them. It, it seems to have uh, sort of some, some aspect of theatre of cruelty, some aspects even more so of, of theatre of the absurd, especially in the way the, 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 the dialogue is, is, is non sequiturs. It doesn't, doesn't really ever lead anywhere. It doesn't tell you anything, and often you're meant to accept sort of fairly preposterous or meaningless things that, that, that people say and, and, and laugh over. And of course there's the, the as I said, there's the, the sort of pervasive physical and, and to an extent mental cruelty that's constantly there. It's, it's, it's there all the time because this is a hard and cruel world and you're never Except in some indoor spaces, you'll never let anything less than up to your ankles in in mud and shit. And you've put up mud and shit on your face and, and everywhere. And you're cold. But yeah, having having got that out of the way, yeah, definitely, definitely recommend this. If if it sounds like something you would enjoy, then please try and track it down on the cinema. Definitely get it on, on DVD or, or if, if it's on a streaming service, try and try and get it there. If it sounds horrible, if it sounds like a, a subtitled black and white film that you wouldn't be interested in, then maybe maybe not for you, but get a try. Go on, get a try. Cheers. Out. <laughs>